Thank you very much for coming out. I really appreciate it. Uh, I just want to introduce myself real quick. My name is Leif Duncan, and I run a 501c3 called ESQ Productions. And it was a project that I started in my first year of law school. We produce business and legal education for artists. Our goal is to really empower artists, specifically filmmakers, to successfully manage their careers from a business perspective while at the same time protecting their artistic integrity. Um, you'll invariably find situations where you'll need to surround yourself with a, fresh, uh, you know, with a full professional team, attorney, agent, whatever it might be. Uh, but the reality is that there's a lot that the filmmaker can do him or herself to you know, secure their rights, run themselves successfully as a business. So that's what we're all about. Um, so really quick thank you to the New York Film Academy for having us as well as uh, Backstage, represented uh, here by Ryan. Thank you for that. And as well, uh, Raw Artists Brooklyn, and Emma is on the panel representing Raw Artists. Um, so we'll get going, um, but just really quickly, uh, some speaker intros. And you can read more about them online. Uh, they're long and they're impressive, so I suggest you do that. Uh, but we're lucky to have them here, and I really appreciate them all taking time. Um, so, Jerry Dasty, immediately to my right, uh, left rather, I don't want to get this wrong. <laughs> uh, Jerry's a partner at the, the law firm Slawstack House, a big entertainment law firm in New York, and he represents clients across the film and television space, um, with an emphasis on representing filmmakers, uh, producers, production companies, uh, throughout the development and production process. He has extensive experience negotiating distribution and licensing agreements on behalf of uh, of his clients, and he advises them you know, with respect to a wide variety of intellectual property issues. Um, his clients include production companies, TV networks, distributors, financiers, actors, writers, producers, and directors. Really, he runs the gamut. Um, uh, to his left, we have Stephen Beer. Stephen is uh, an attorney at the law firm Franklin Weinberg, another major entertainment law firm here in New York. Um, Stephen focuses on film, TV, as well as music, um, and he reps leading production companies as well as distribution companies, writers, directors, producers, etc. Uh, cool fact that I read that uh, Stephen's actually been listed as a super lawyer in New York, which is a really prestigious thing, annually since 2006, um, which actually puts, I think I read that it puts you in the top 5% of attorneys in New York State. Is that correct? <laughs> I didn't bring my cape today. <laughs> I don't want to. That, that is true. Um, I, I'm even more proud of the fact that um, I was listed in the Ted Hope's uh, 21 top uh, uh, truly uh, top uh, 21 most um, uh, I guess, uh, path blazers in the film. I think that to yeah. me is. Uh, that to me is more interesting and uh, personally satisfying than being a super lawyer. Yeah. Uh, Stephen is regularly at the major uh, festivals and markets, uh, Sundance, Tribeca, South by Southwest, Cannes, where he negotiates uh, distribution rights deals on behalf of many independent clients. You can check out uh, Jerry and Stephen's IMDb page for their credits. They're long, put it that way. Um, all the way to my left uh, is Emma Marie Riley. Emma is the creative director of Raw Artists Brooklyn. And uh, in the con in later on the panel, she'll give you a better idea as to what exactly Raw Artists does, um, if you aren't already familiar with them. Uh, but uh, she's originally from the Bay Area, California, um, now based in Brooklyn. Uh, she joined Raw in 2010 and uh, was important in expanding the company from L.A. to San Francisco. The company started in L.A. Um, at that point, she took off, said, I've got better things to do. And she moved to London, where she wrote uh, and produced works for the Actors Center of London, the Cannes Film Festival, the Shaw Theatre at King's Cross, among other places. At which point, she came back to New York and uh, worked to build Raw Artists Brooklyn into the largest chapter of Raw, uh, Raw Artists, which is now an international um, on the side, outside of Raw, she's done a lot of really cool projects as well. She's done creative direction and collaborated on projects and openings for the New Museum, Cream Magazine, Huffington Post, W Hotels, MGMT, 
our station, Robert Lux, and many, many others. So again, their files are all online, great on their impressive. Uh, so with that said, um, the panel tonight is about the current state of independent film production and distribution. Quick side note, this was originally supposed to happen back in November, beginning of November, and then Hurricane Sandy happened, and it was a mess. So we, we ultimately postponed. It was a bummer at the time, but I think that in the long run, the purpose of this event, it worked out for the best, because now we can add Sundance 2013 to the conversation, and that sort of you know, gives us a broader perspective on some of the issues we're gonna be talking about. That's really the point. We're gonna be talking about the current state of the industry sort of through the lens of some of these major festivals and markets, Sundance, Toronto in particular. Um, and I think it's really important to you know, look at it year over year and understand how the market operates. Um, in, reading, in reading up for this panel, um, I actually found out that you know, in, in, in law school, I would go to these entertainment law conferences. UCLA and USC put on great annual conferences. And the theme every year was, well, we don't know what's happening. Uh, no one knows what's happening. It's the Wild West. These deals are still evolving on a daily basis, it seems, and certainly market to market, festival to festival. Um, and the interesting thing, I, I read that it was actually predicted by at least one person, probably maybe more, but uh, George Gilder, um, author, technologist. And in George Gilder wrote a book in, as far back as, it was in 1985, and he predicted this sort of uh, proliferation of distribution points that he thought was going to fundamentally change the way that entertainment was distributed and ultimately consumed. And uh, you know, he thought that through this proliferation of these distribution points, there would be a, a fundamental sort of tectonic shift away from distribution being the commodity to now content being the commodity. We think that why isn't content always the commodity? Content should be king, you should have a quality product. Um, but now with the you know, various distribution models, if you want to call them a platform, a model, a channel, whatever we call them for conversation, uh, you know, it's just uh, it's a much different time. And I think that I'll avoid cliche and camp as much as possible, but I'm excited for this particular conversation because it's an exciting time to be an indie filmmaker. I mean, the fact is that uh, opportunities exist today that just weren't part of the conversation even five years ago, certainly ten years ago. Um, and we're sort of in, if you look at you know, George Gilder's prediction, it's almost like a renaissance period. I don't know if, if you all will agree or disagree, we can suss that out. But I think it's, it's exciting nonetheless. Um, uh, it's just a, it's a much different time, there's a lot going on. So that's what, really what we're going to talk about, how these models are changing and hopefully provide you with some insight as to uh, how you can capitalize on this. You know, the question now that we understand that there's, there's this fundamental shift, the question becomes one of, well, how do, you, how do you leverage your content within the context of these new platforms? Uh, you know, ultimately, hoping to answer the question, how do you become more successful in the um, So with that, I'm done. I want to hand it off to these guys. We have a lot to talk about, and I'll, I'll ask plenty of questions as we go throughout. If you have questions, I'd love to have you just interrupt us and lead the discussion your way. Um, but I thought that I would uh, start with Sundance 2012, go back in time a little bit, um, because I think that there was a pretty, there were, you may not call it significant, maybe it was something less, but there was certainly a contrast between Sundance 2012 and Sundance 2013 with the, how the deals were actually structured. Um, I think the consensus coming out of 2012 is that there were a wide variety of deals by a variety of distributors for reasonable prices, um, and Sundance 2013 seemed to be a little bit of an uptick from that potential. Um, so I just wonder if we can maybe get your thoughts on, on that. Um, that's right. uh, I agree. I mean, it seemed like this year at Sundance there were more deals, there were more deals in the mid-level range that were happening there at the festival. Um, and, you know, in terms of how the deals are structured, I don't know necessarily that um, there is a big difference in how the deals were structured 2012 to 2013. Maybe this year there's a bit more of a push to sort of get these uh, ultra VOD or day and day VOD deals, um, you know, with Radius, what uh, might see companies, companies sort of being a little bit more active this year. Um, one thing to me, that it seemed like to me, one reason why, in particular, these, these sort of um, 
you know, mid to high six figures, like one million dollar deals uh, were happening with more frequencies. It seemed there's more of those like mid level distributors that were buying this year. You know, it's just I mean, it's it's just in some respects, it's a pure market. There's more people with money to buy content. It's going to drive the prices up a little bit. So you have like A24 and Radius, and, you know, like I mentioned, a few more who are out. You know, CBS Films is a little bit more active buying. Um, so I, to me, that was one of the main reasons why, like I said, those that size of deal is a little bit more. So you'd be happy with a little more frequency, mm -hmm. at least at the festival. Yeah. 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 And you had a similar perspective? Or? Um, I think mixed. Uh, too frequently, we concentrate on the sensational, glamorous, uh, newsworthy transactions that are six figure and and low seven figure, and that's really exciting, and it is newsworthy because for the last five years we witnessed a drought where there was so much downward pressure um, in the marketplace, and the distributors were really calling the shots. There had been a thinning out of the herd of, of independent film distributors, and so with only a handful of, of viable distribution companies capable of writing a check, it was such a buyer's market. Um, in, in 2012, uh, IndieWire published an article I, I wrote uh, at the very beginning of, of Sundance, um, calling it a, a distribution for the 99%, because if you really worked, uh, if you looked at the numbers of people that applied to Sundance, the number of films that, uh, that Sundance program, and then the number of films that, that got these full service deals, the holy grail, you know, the special um, brass ring deal, it really was 1% of, of all folks entering uh, applying to Sundance. If you look at it that way, it's, you know, it, it's still, it was, it, it was a drought in 2012, we predicted that, and um, in 2013 it certainly improved, as Jerry said given the increase in players and the sort of comfort level of, of competition of, of, of uh, being able to get a, a film that you could monetize in the market without having to spend a ton of money on traditional media. Um, and uh, so there were films that, that tended to be better fit for more players. So it is trending positive, but I, I do want to uh, emphasize that we're you know, we tend to look at the exceptions, the newsworthy projects, and you s maybe it's not the nine distribution for the 99% uh, that we should be, maybe it's the 95%. We're still talking about an exception to the rule. Most independent films will struggle for distribution uh, in the, if you're looking at the traditional model. And that's why you, sitting here today, really ought to be thinking as you come into the marketplace at, uh, at the, the probability that you are going to have to um, take on uh, as much responsibility in marketing and distributing your film as you had in creating your film. And I think that's a, that's, that trend is, is only going to increase even where the number of uh, the marketplace is improving and the number of uh, distribution companies is increasing ever so slightly. We're still looking at a place where filmmakers uh, as producers or producers need to be very savvy about how they create, market, and distribute their films. Going, uh, just going back just real quickly to Sundance 2012, you had on the service level at least, uh, well, there were a variety of deals made by a variety of distribution companies. They were being reasonable deals. There was a, I, I read one article that uh, borrowed uh, great spans, irrational exuberance term, right? And there was less of that in the marketplace at that point. Uh, and more, you know, reason deals. Uh, you, you mentioned day and date, and I want to go into more detail on that, definitely, uh, just in a bit. But, um, you know, examples of deals, like, like Radius was in on one of them, I know that uh, Arbitrage and, and Lay the Favorite had good deals, and, and Beast of the Southern Wild had a great, well, I forget the specifics of their deal coming out of, uh, uh, coming out of Sundance, but these were great deals um, in the time Following Sundance 2012, though, there, 
those sorts of films were sort of seen as they became it became known that they were anomalous, right? That the majority of films sold at Sundance 2012 were struggling to recoup their negative costs rather than not even having a conversation about turning a profit. So I wanted to ask you, Emma, especially when it comes to I mean, we're talking you know lay the favorite and arbitrage films that are you know closer to the top of the spectrum certainly, but uh, how important you know within the context of these new distribution deals that are available now, they're at least part of the conversation, how important is branding? How important is the, is the filmmaker's involvement in stewarding the, the project through whatever windows they decide to pass through in, uh, in, in, in keeping that momentum alive, whether they're coming out of the market or otherwise? I think people really underestimate the fact that good business is actually the best art. Um, and it's a motto that I've kind of lived my life along. And I think that if you're able to kind of realize that and encompass that alongside, parallel, with your vision, then um, you kind of hit a home run. Um, and the issue is that a lot of people nowadays get so consumed in how rapid I think uh, the market can be, um, and also how translucent it is in that they don't study it enough. Um, they read maybe an article or two or apply something that they pulled from A to B and they really don't match. Um, and I think that that's something that you really have to avoid. If you're looking to create a career that's really um, 20 plus exactly, your career. So, yeah. I mean, it's as simple as that in my opinion. Yeah. And, and does Raw, does Raw provide any sort of support on the branding side, on the like, brand development? I, well, I mean, brand development, maybe not necessarily brand development. I think in terms of um, really uh, basically placing in front of artists, uh, like I was saying earlier, a platform in which they can step onto and then um, profit from. Yeah. Because it doesn't matter really how talented you actually are unless you're able to yeah. take that talent and um, put it in front of the right people right. at the right time. Right. Um, and that's what we focus on doing with the artists that we work with. I wanted to flash forward a little bit to Toronto last year because I think that it was just a similar, a similar uh, feeling leaving, uh, leaving Toronto as, as it existed leaving Sundance. So, again, it was slow and steady, slow and steady because of the, the, you know, the deals were more reasoned, they were more calculated. Uh, there was going to be this, this strong chance of, uh, of the market, of, of market resurgence. Then you get to uh, Sundance 2013, all of a sudden you've got these huge deals. Uh, the Way Way Back and Don John's Addiction saw numbers that, well, The Way Way Back broke a record, I think. Um, uh, I think Little Miss Sunshine held it previously, but, uh, you know, much larger numbers. So in your, in your opinion, you know, what changed, you know, in, in just a year? Uh, one thing changed is that uh, the mini majors are really out of the production game. So if they could get a finished, if the, the realization that if they can get a finished film for the price that they would have spent to to produce one, to develop and produce one, and, and in a risky scenario where who knows what the film's going to look like and how many wars and battles with the filmmaker and the producer without the sort of the traditional overhead that the mini majors have had for many years. So fewer uh, fewer films being made by these companies they present opportunities for those companies, the larger um, distributors within the independent world. And um, so it's still an opportunity for them. If you can pick up a finished film that they strongly believe has a, has a built in market and has the ability to be, mar uh, to be marketed to, to uh, folks that follow awards and, um, and to distinct audiences that you can, um, that you can access online and uh, digital and, and tradi traditional media, you know, if it really hits that sweet spot, why not step up? Because that's the, that's the uh, casino table that those folks are comfortable in anyway. The, the good news is that the casino is getting bigger and bigger, uh, but there's, the, there's still that, that fancy part of the casino, the one where people wear the tuxedos and there's that red velvet robe and the minimum bet is a is a thousand dollars. I've 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 peered over the rope, but I've never stepped inside <laughs> it. I've never been invited to, and, and I don't have authority to spend my money at the thousand dollar minimum bet table. 
but it still exists. It, you know, and it's fun to look at. It's like spectator sport, but is it really relevant for most of us? I mean, we can talk about that. But so of the of the um, you know, the ten thousands of films that are made, you know, you get this one that really hits it out of the park. My fear is that um, everyone's going to chase that. Um, you know that that elusive dream. It's, it's essentially a lottery ticket, and uh, where you play roulette. And, you know, that's a. I think it's a rare film. It's a film that has that typically has um, stars, that has um, a director with some uh, with a reputation or or such heat, and so many things lining up behind it that it's you know, it's the rare um, it's the rare exceptional project. I think that the, the better our focus is on the, the emerging uh, minimum bet tables in the casino, and that's what's exciting to me in this, this new renaissance paradigm. Um, I wrote an article that Berkeley uh, Law uh, Entertainment Law Journal published last year called The New um, Renaissance Paradigm, A Breakthrough Time for Artists. And in that, I, I prefer to focus on the emerging opportunities that are really unprecedented for content creators, for filmmakers, at these new minimum bet tables where you can, you can have a perfectly good time at a $5 table. The point is, you, the content creator, get to define success, not some institution or some trade magazine that's beholden to their sponsors or the institution that is beholden to uh, the constituent companies, which are beholden to parent companies and to shareholders. You know, what kind of craft can really, what kind of breakthrough um, content are we really looking at or talking about with, with companies like that? I think it's entertainment, it's sort of spectator sport. But for me, what, what you know, really gets me excited and why I'm, I'm pumped to be living in this renaissance is this, um, is the new breakthrough content and the opportunities to market and distribute them without being beholden to third parties. Now, you can exercise that same independence as you market and distribute your film as you did when you created that film. And because the budgets are modest thanks to technology and innovation and, and new uh, business practices that, that, that embrace order and, um, and uh, collaboration practices. And I mean, this truly is the renaissance. You know, I know that we're supposed to talk about the um, Grandstand and wonderful, sensational stories that, that behind that red velvet rope. But I'm really pumped about um, all these other stories because those are the stories of the artists, those are the stories of the content creators, and those are the stories of the audience because that's where the breakthrough work is is being created. And because of the internet and, uh, and the way it's, it's developing and being organized, we as, as consumers get to, get to see that. Um, and that's why we truly are in the Renaissance. I, I spent as much time at Slam Dance this, this January as I spent at, um, at Sundance. And it's not that I don't love Sundance, I really do. And I, I participated in the events and work with films in there. And um, I, I really like the breakthrough of um, voices, the, the people that, that are telling raw um, um, stories that take me to a place that I wouldn't ordinarily go to. And, and you don't need a lot of money if the story is told well and, and uh, if it has a distinctive voice for, for those, uh, those stories to carry. The Sundance film, uh, Beast of the Southern Wild, is an example of that. That was a breakthrough. We know the Sundance had slam dance, but it wasn't, it wasn't a film that was made for a ton of money um, initially. They kept putting money in because it had traffic, <coughs> but initially that story was told for, for a modest bet. It wasn't that the red, the red Velvet broke the exclusive part of the casino. I'm excited to be um, practicing law and working with filmmakers in this new renaissance. I'm excited to be uh, meeting with people um, like uh, like uh, you know, Emily Marie and, and, and hearing about the raw artists. And um, and I think that you know Jerry and I we we're doing this law. You know, it's not it may not be the most lucrative in this aspect of law. It's not mortgage-backed securities, but it's really exciting when you're working with with uh, great projects. And that's what, um, you know, that's really why I'm excited to, you know, to, be, to, to be witnessing this, this renaissance and why I'm excited to share those stories with you. Can I have a question? Yeah, yeah. What, uh, I, I'm curious, actually, uh, what 
what do you think about that through payoff? And was it, what, 2.5? Yeah, it was a, it was a huge sale. Yeah. 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 But I mean, it's interesting because Ryan Cooper is a lot first time director. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's kind of a combination of the two, I suppose, right? I don't know. I mean, but so here's my observation, and I'll, just, I'll be a lot quicker this time. I, I apologize. Uh, so this is a detail of the kind of story. I have not seen it, so it's full disclosure. But you're seeing a, a smaller film with a distinct audience because it was it's a very it's a specialized film with um, with uh, gender uh, issues, and, and and the reason why a film like that can do well in this marketplace is because Companies are, are, the technology is there to access the audiences, the constituent audiences that will embrace that, that kind of film. Five years ago, 10 years ago, we didn't have uh, the sort of widespread access for, um, for VOD, you know, cable VOD, and, and uh, subscription VOD, and all this, this direct audience. Um, uh, you don't have to. The, the economies of scale are so approved that it actually makes sense to pick up a film like this because you know you won't have to spend a ton of money in uh, your traditional media in getting it out there to that specialized audience. That's 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 my take. I think that's significant about proof film. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I again full disclosure. I haven't seen the film either. I was surprised a little bit by the size of what yeah. it sold for. I it was one of the films of the festival. I mean, everyone was talking about it. People were raving about it. But it, it is it's a small film. It's a dark film. You know, it's it's not an uplifting film. And you know, it's and unfortunately, in the minds of a lot of distributors, it's an African American. You know, so I was actually a little bit surprised, pleasantly surprised by the size of that deal, yeah. and we'll see if it works out. That was yeah. points. Right? Yeah, it was yeah. So I mean, that's maybe part of it too. Yeah. They, if, if if they latch on to something they like, they will pay for right. it. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's it's. I'm, I'm happy for for the filmmaker. And yeah. I'm happy for the team, and, and, and hopefully it's a success because it encourages uh, more deals for films, right. you know, like that. So that's a perfect example. I mean, if you look, if you take the idea that uh, generally you are going to be able to only count on a much smaller, at least uh, domestic minimum guarantee, if you want to retain the possibility of making money on the film and paying your, at least allowing your financiers to recoup, hopefully turn a profit, then in this in this new in this new state of the industry. Budgets, you touched on this earlier, Stephen, but like the budgets need to be reverse engineered. It needs to be something you're thinking about from the beginning. Right? So how how does that how does that that sort of micro focus on on you know one particular audience segment, how does that influence the budgeting process? Is that something you're dealing with, you know, with your clients advising them on? Well, I mean, look, no one in the independent film space is is throwing, you know, is, is increasing their budgets without reason. You know, I mean, maybe studios do, but you know, they, I, I think you know, for certain of the clients I work with, they're going to make the movie for the price they can make it at. Like, that, you know, that they want to make it as lean as possible because it makes it easier to raise. You know, there's a yeah. limited amount of financing that you can raise, and certainly, you know, in, in terms of you know, attracting financing, it's it's uh, okay. We want to get this cast member in because then we get some, some better farm, you know, uh, pre-sale numbers or better projections, which will help you know reassure our financiers, that sort of thing. But I don't know that it's necessarily like, okay, the thought process is we're making a movie for this one particular segment of the audience, so that's why I'm going to be budgeting this leanly. I think it's, I want to budget this as leanly as I can because I just really want to make it as easy as I can to raise the financing. Okay. Well, I guide my clients to pare down their budgets radically because I want them to convert their investors into partners. If the investors make their money back, and, and the lower the budget, the faster they're going to make their money back, and the less risk they have when the time comes to take it to the market. If they can recoup their investors' money, their investor will come back for another film and another film because they feel like they've been respected, and it was a good experience, and it's hard to go out and raise money every film. It's like reinventing the wheel. So if you can start building a body of, of, of support, um, the best way to do that is by 
reducing your budget so that you not you don't have to hit a grand slam in order to, to make your second film. You know, how do you define success? If, if, if you're interested in a sustaining career, then be inventive and make tell your story on a very modest budget. Return money to your investors and they will be around there for your around there to support you for the next film. That's that's how I come to it. What sort of work does Raw do to when you aggregate an audience to you know showcase the final product and you know what sort of guidance is given in that respect? Um, well I think mean, I, I just at this conversation is money makes money um, in a lot of respects. Um, and I think that budgeting is necessary and uh, knowing the audience that you're budgeting your project for is also necessary, of course. But um, in terms of what Rod does for promoting um, artists as a profession, being an artist or a filmmaker or a musician as a profession, I mean, that's really what we're there for. Um, not to promote the the company too much, but um, we provide, like I said, a platform through um, online databases that are very limited in terms of the content that you're allowed to put up. Um, so while you're budgeting fiscally, you also need to be aware of your presence online and um, the way that you are kind of, uh, your image. Um, so we provide a platform for that in terms of a one page uh, hit, I guess, a Google hit. Yeah. Um, that's pretty major. Um, a show as well as a full video and, and photo set, which then works to promote you and your image specifically as a professional artist because that's what's most important, I think. Um, you can be as talented, like I said before, as you are, but if you're not able to get it out, then no one's going to see it. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> yeah, that's that's As awful awesome as it is to say, yeah. it's just the truth. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people are very mediocre and are very successful. <laughs> it's true, you know? I mean, it's horrible to say, but it's just the truth. But if you're able to uh, look at art as a business, um, then I think that that's the point in which you're able to make a living doing it. So. Do you think that these relatively or, or comparatively larger deals that were out of Sundance this year, do you think that because of those, there are going to be there's going to be increased pressure on those films to perform, justify those numbers, and that could adversely influence, you know, later this year, Toronto, and, and, and moving forward. I mean, I'm sure that the distributors that pick them up want them to, yeah. to perform, and if they yeah. jump, that you know, I mean, the way way back is is an example. You know, it's an example. You know, you think of some of those other like ten million dollar deals over the years, like Happy Texas, Hamlet Two. Like there's 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 a string of these. This is the biggest deal ever at Sundance, and the film doesn't perform. So I think maybe you know whether it's Toronto or, or Sundance next year before you really figure that out. You know, for like a ten million dollar deal, maybe there won't be one next year if, if this you know, if the way way back doesn't do well, or if Don uh, John's addiction doesn't do well, there won't be another twenty five million dollar P and A commitment for a movie of that scale. I was just going to say, don't you think it's interesting that in terms of socially, kind of the market socially, in terms of small business owners, and in terms of um, self-promotion and, and I guess self-management and whatnot is, is, is mirrored in, in your industry in some ways? I mean, in terms of uh, smaller distribution deals um, and really indie films being fairly really successful over uh, more marketable, more expensive films. It's not really. You know, it's 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 content specific largely yeah. too. I mean, you can discount that like sometimes a a a four hundred thousand dollar movie is just a really successful film, yeah. and a ten million dollar movie isn't. Isn't. You know, so it's it's a little hard to for me at least to generalize in that yeah. respect. But well, thinking about like you know the oh I'm sorry yeah yeah no, I'm just curious to return back to the. Um, you're talking about kind of the, the lower budget, you know, at the five dollar minimum table. I'm just curious about it from a revenue perspective. Uh, how are you seeing them recover their costs? I mean, I, I get the sense that independent filmmakers have an opportunity. You know, they go going festival shopping and they hope it all works out. And I, I feel like it's more often the case that investors aren't seeing their money back in kind of a sub one million dollar budget range. Um, and yes, the costs are lower than they were before, but even if it's Three hundred, five hundred, a hundred, yeah, a million dollars, one point five, and where are you seeing the opportunities outside of getting picked up at a festival? Uh, we've got day and date. We've got 
the VOD element, where are they recovering costs on kind of a non theatrical basis if they don't get picked up at the festival? Uh, wow, inventory, that's a, that's a, thank you for asking the question. It's, it's a fat pitch. Um, first of all, most, most films don't get picked up at a festival. Um, and where they are earning revenue is, is um, pretty much what you mentioned is going straight to your consumer with a VOD uh, platform and, and with uh, either Netflix or iTunes and Amazon and more and more of these, of these uh, uh, digital platforms are opening up. Then you don't just put it up there. That's the start. Then you have to market it to your to your consumer. And if you if you did a Kickstarter or an Indiegogo or a Seed and Spark campaign, you've been aggregating your audience from the beginning. And um, so you have on the one side of the casino, as we discussed in that metaphor, you, know, you have the traditional marketplace, but there are all kinds of DIY uh, or hybrid uh, producers who have mastered the alternate universe of semi uh, consisting of semi-theatrical um, screenings that are events that bring people together. And uh, if, if there is a, an issue, a documentary is especially good for that kind of um, screening, then you can do direct sales at the screening. You can sell merchandise at the screening. You can bring in sponsors and, and, um, and uh, partners, uh, industry partners, uh, at the, you know, as you develop them. You can sell advertising as, um, as part of your, you can even just put it on YouTube and, and, and they can sell it depending on how micro you want to go. Um, it's, it's, it's about good content. It's about um, setting up a, uh, an audience that, is, that really seeks to, to see what you're doing. I mean, look at, the, look at what happened with, with the micro budget of tiny furniture. Turned into, uh, um, you know, again, it's an exception, but, but, but look, you know, it, it's really turned into uh, a masterful enterprise for, for her. And that was because she told a story, she built an audience. It became the talk of, of, of uh, great word, digital word of mouth, as well as journalists, because this was a, a breakthrough project. It had a, a story to tell. In one way, in one way it was a very accessible story, where, where um, you know, a tale of, that we would see over and over again, but the novel way, the humorous way that it was told, um, you know, that was a micro-budget project. Um, and that went from an accessible digital platform where you could see it in parts on YouTube to being acquired and then um, having via a VOD uh, presentation, which is pretty accessible. Um, and uh, so you keep that budget low and you market to you, to an audience. And if the project is good, you will you will attract a, a consumer on a per transaction basis. If you're doing it yourself, you'll make more money. So I, mean, I think the trap is going with a traditional distributor for a film that doesn't really work for them as a matter of scale. Uh, it's, you know, they don't, they you know, they've got a ton of, of, of product that they need to concentrate on. If you're selling your own, if you're distributing your own product, this is your baby. You're going to raise it any way you want to. You're going to know how to market that film, assuming you surround yourself with the specialized marketers, which people who really understand digital marketing. You're probably going to uh, uh, understand how to get that film out there, and in the process, promote yourself, which will draw attention to your future projects. I, I like that model, but again, you need to keep those budgets the budgets low. And and the nice thing about it is that you'll get to make that film faster. Um, you can do your crowdfunding and maybe raise all the money or some of the money, um, certainly, and then you can combine that with with soft money. Um, programs at the various uh, state level, New York being one of them. It's got a great program. So if it's a million dollar film, you may only have to raise a half a million dollars. So you've recouped your money to your investors, maybe even less if you've done a good job in your company. Maybe you've only made a quarter of a million dollars back, and you've already recouped uh, your investors' money, and you're off making your next film. So it doesn't even matter if the entire negative budget hasn't been recouped. You're just worried, you're just concerned about getting your equity investors 
their money back because you don't need to pay the state back the money for the credit, and you don't need to uh, to pay your your Kickstarter sponsors for, for their donations. That's that's uh, attachment free. Those are the strategies that you need to think about um, as well as well as you as marketing the film. And, uh, of course, the most important thing is make a good film. People want to watch it. You should need to tell people. There's a, there's a bit of a middle ground too, right? I mean, you're, obviously, you're right. I mean, most films do not sell at, at festivals. Most films do not get theatrical distribution, certainly. But there's there's you know a bit of proliferation of you know, digital aggregators. So rather than having to go and do your iTunes deal, your Netflix deal directly, you know, you sign up with a company like New Video or Film Buff. There's a few other ones who like have their overall deals, and they're much more. Um, they take a lot more chances with the films that they acquire because their their overhead and their startup cost of each film are, are relatively low. But again, like in that model, they will do some of your promotion, but you will be wanting to do a lot of it as well. And in terms of you know sort of what Stephen referred to as semi theatrical, I mean I, I really think the tug model is going to be much bigger over the, term over the next couple of years. You know, sort of like you said, sort of gathering a group of people who are interested in this one particular film. Whether it's a documentary or, or, or a narrative film, and it's you know for sort of specific scheduled theatrical screenings. I think more than like creating an audience, it's almost helping you. Yeah, you're aggregating it, but you're 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 seeing it and then finding them, accessing them, yeah. and then you're, you're building them and taking them and then motivating them, you're finding them and then motivating them, and keeping them abreast of your activities every step of the way because they feel somehow you've been invested in your project. In your sense, I mean, this there used to be this stigma about VOD, right? I mean, it used to be thought of as a second class mm -hmm. distribution model, all of that, and you know, whether we're talking about the you know higher end or lower end of the market, do you in your experience is that does that stigma still exist? Are people accepting that this is the way of the future and you know catch it or be left behind sort of thing? Or, I, I think a lot of producers, producers and directors are, not all of them. I mean, there still is a glamour to having a traditional theatrical release, and it's, and it, you know, it's, it's typically, you know, creates a higher profile. Um, but uh, I think more and more of them are smart about it, more and more of them, more and more, you know, folks that I work with just, you know, they want their movie to be seen. And, and even with a traditional theatrical release with an independent film, you're in maybe like five or six markets. And you know, there's going to be people in Iowa or Oklahoma or or where have you that that, that want to see the film and need the ability to do it. Like, I, there's no theater nearby that's showing it. So I think I think more and more, you know, the people I work with, my clients, are realizing that and are excited about you know the opportunity to reach a wider audience than VOD and other digital sort of platforms, right? So the, 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 the significant factor here and a takeaway is um, is really uh, the C word, it's, it's control. On the one hand, it's it's very special to get that um, brass ring at the festival, for the festival pickup, and, um, and they're going to commit to you know, 10 screens and you know, eight markets or, but, um, you really you go from the driver's seat where you have your hands on the steering wheel while you're creating your film to uh, escort it to the back seat of, if you're invited in the car at all with, with whatever meaningful consultation it really gets you. Um, and uh, for many filmmakers who are really thoughtful about the way they made their film, they really want to be able to play a role, have, to have at least one hand on the steering wheel, in how that film is marketed and, and distributed there are just so many more opportunities for them to do that. Um, you talk about uh, what used to be um, looked at negatively was the you know, four-walling theaters. Oh, you couldn't get your own, you couldn't get your uh, distribution, um, you couldn't get a big distributor to go out and um, spend your money and pick it up and put it out in the theaters and all. You know, those big, those big distributors have massive overhead. It's an overhead machine that will will um, invariably make your road to recruitment a lot trickier. And uh, you know, so you can you can accomplish those goals and, and now you can go out and four wall or put up your own 
find all these venues, whether it's restaurants or, or libraries or university campuses, just so many um, uh, opportunities to, in, in the non-theatrical and semi-theatrical environment for you to get it out there for a, a lot less. It's still a big, beautiful screen in front of audiences that you can, where you can have um, talk back just by being, basically you create your own travel and festival where you, you own, own the all the assets and you get to speak to your audience and you get to build them and they, they're now part of your army for this film and the next film after that. And that's really, it's the, in the new renaissance, it's the artist and entrepreneur who, who will dominate and not the person looking in the rear view mirror at those traditional models which work for that one or two percent. Is that what you're seeing, a really holistic approach from the people you're working with, the artists you're working with, they're, they're looking at it from a but they're you know they're stepping back and assessing their options and maybe they're going with one route for one project maybe a different route for another and they're just really you know thriving in that freedom or do you see it as a source of confusion for some people? So. Well, I mean, hopefully it's the first, but I most often than not it's the latter. I mean, it's and it's just the fact of the matter. I mean, I come from uh, I've basically developed my artistic ambition into a business, uh, and I'm still very young, but I've kind of like. Uh, I, I began to understand about three years ago that that was really the only way I was going to make a living doing what I wanted to do. Um, and so while more often than not we see the latter, what we hope to see is the first, of course. And I mean, I think that that's something that uh, is, I mean, while in general everything is far too rapid to really learn nowadays, it's also really great that you can get yourself out there on the internet and, you know, through your own social media sources and screening your own films and whatnot and really create a career for yourself. If you're determined to, that's the thing though. Yeah. You know, and I mean, a lot of people are really um, caught up in uh, a, a vision that's really too uh, fit. Yeah. And it, it, it really needs to be brought, especially if you're trying to create a, a long withstanding, withholding career. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if we could talk a little bit about how it actually happens. You know, so I, in, in reading about, you know, post, uh, artists coming out of these festivals, I, I read, it was Sundance uh, this year, that uh, Rena Ronson at UTA was talking about, and she's in the, uh, in the independent film group, one of the major agencies, talking about how, you know, the deals are taking longer because the components of the deals are more complicated, and you're going through, you know, bit by bit, making sure that you're, you know, you know, capitalizing on all areas for clients. So we're talking about, you know, the you know, major agencies. That's one end of the market. How is an independent filmmaker actually going to steward a project through the various windows that they elect to go through? They're not, say they're outside the context of the festival or market. Are they going to a producer's rep and reserving whatever they can and trying to exploit that themselves? Are they, you know, how are they actually finding that, that balance? Um, I think the producer's rep is a, is a, 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 is a popular way for, for producers and filmmakers to go because the producer's rep, have, they have their relationships and they don't need to reinvent the wheel and they have the pulse on a very dynamic market. They know who's looking for what and where the fits are. So I, I, I actually believe that the successful artist entrepreneur is, is works with specialists, whether you call them a, a distribution consultant or a producer's rep, I think it's really important to, to work with experts uh, who understand um, where, the, where the pieces of the puzzle fit, because it's, a, it's a, just like making your first film, there's so much you don't know, you learn it through experience. Marketing or shooting your first film is, it can, can be just as painful. Um, if you are a fiduciary, if you've raised money, uh, even if it's just friends, family, fans, but investors too, you have a responsibility to take care of them. And, and I think it really behooves you to seek out experts who can guide you, wilderness guide, because it is a wilderness. It's, it, there's, no, there's no such thing as a fungible film. And the, the, the exciting but scary thing about the, the, um, the new renaissance is that you have these customized success plans 
that contour around your definition of success. What are your goals for it? If people are giving you money and they're, they have an expectation of a return on investment, then you, you need to do everything possible to help them achieve that. And if you don't really understand the specialized market, you need help. You, gotta get, you have to go get some, uh, some guidance, a consultant or, or a rep or someone that, uh, that really understands how the deals work. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Stephen. I think a lot of, you know, particularly uh, folks who haven't had the experience of having one of their films released before will seek out the advice of, you know, whether it's a producer's rep, whether it's an attorney, whether it's a consultant of some, you know, some kind to really advise them about uh, the smartest way to go about it. And um, that's also somewhere where, you know, some, like, if, if it's going to be a digital release, something like a digital aggregator, like I mentioned before, is helpful because they can. You know, to the extent something needs to be windowed, or they see an opportunity in sort of like a cable-based distribution versus an internet-based distribution, they can find that um, um, correctly. And, and you do have to be a little bit careful because if you go straight out and put your film on YouTube, that's going to close a lot of doors to other potential. Like, you know, there's a lot of, uh, of other outlets that will not take your film once it's been on YouTube. Once it's available for free to people, they're not going to pay. They're not going to watch it on a Netflix subscription. So you just have to be a little bit like. Conscious of, of, of the best opportunities to take at the right time, and it's, you know, like Stephen was saying, a producer's rep or some sort of advisor in that regard can be very helpful. Mm -hmm. yeah. So within the con, I'm, I'm sorry, we were gonna, no, I was, I was just going to ask that within the context of these newer types of deals, uh, you know, what sort of opportunities are there for the filmmakers to share in, uh, to move the conversation to the back end and share in? Ancillary rights to share in contingent compensation is that is that happening is that is that a reality or is that just you know one of the things that's reserved for the for the high net worth table? No, I, I think we, I I have seen documentaries modestly budgeted documentaries turn into businesses where given the subject matter. It was attractive to brands to come on board. It was attractive to not-for-profits to come in and lend their, their lists and do a lot of the organization work, uh, where you were able to, to sell books or posters or t-shirts at these events uh, and to have receptions that, uh, that could uh, present things that were brand extensions. I mean, it's, it's really what you make of uh, the, the film is one thing. And if you're really looking for a, uh, a distribution partner that's excited about your project, show them a film business, not just a film. Show them something that really um, speaks to how they can really get their arms around it, that has extensions into sequels and prequels, uh, that has fan club. And, um, and opportunities for events that has a book involved, maybe it's a coffee table book, but that uh, that sort of introduces the viewer into a culture. It has a soundtrack, it has an artist, uh, or artists that have visual, musical, that will tour with the project um, and, and do performances. It's really, it's, it's, it's what the, um, Know, whatever you can imagine, that's where uh, that's the, that's exciting to uh, um, to investors because there, there's just so much to work with, not just a film, but but an environment, a culture, and uh, and and a, a broad platform of, of a broad range of potential you know, businesses. Uh, and I, I think it's more likely that you will see. Um, your back ends from a distributor, not just in a modestly budgeted film, but you know, in these sort of more modest deals that we've been talking about. You know, if, if you have a distributor who is maybe a smaller distributor, but a leaner one, you know, keeps their overhead under control, or you get some, some sort of control or cap on the overhead charges and the, the expenses that they're putting out, you know, it's more that they have less to recoup before they start paying out to the producers. When you talk about, you know, a Fox Searchlight, you know, which is, I mean, they are the best at marketing these, you know, the types of films we see Sunday. So they, they are the top of the line. They're great. They make huge successes out of, you know, *Beast of the Southern Wild* or other modestly budgeted pictures. But you, 
it's in the amount of money they spend on marketing, and it's and you know sort of there's general Fox accounting system. It's it's going to be years, if ever, that you know the filmmakers actually see you know <laughs> revenue beyond whatever advance or minimum guarantee was paid to them. Yeah. <clears throat> in the production point of view, at what point of the creative process then do we include this branding mechanism in the stories and this relationship with the uh, with the marketeers? Because sometimes the creator, uh, so creating the movie, the writing the story, we miss this place for the branding and for the commercialization of the whole story. So at what time, you know, at what level of the story we should you recommend that we integrate this? commercial aspect of the artistic. You know, again, in, in, in this sort of new renaissance, first with the filmmaker to find success. If that's part of their success model, then they really need to execute on that right at the beginning. And you could start with product placement, because even if you're not getting money to have your product in the film, you're at least laying the groundwork for issues or, or products or um, Red partners to come in and, and, and integrate into your project. And um, I think every film is a business. And I, I would absolutely encourage every person here to put a business plan together because you should have a revenue model and you should really be very clear what the expectations are for the business. Too often, there is a very difference of opinion as to what the number one priority is between the investors on the one hand who are focused on return on, on, on investment and the filmmaker who's really interested in, in seeing their their beautiful baby screened in, 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 the right, uh, in the right theaters because they really believe that that will enhance their career and if it gets that kind of um, distribution partner then maybe they might get an agent or a manager <coughs> and maybe they'll be able to attract Material for their, their next film. So I think understanding, crystallizing what the project priorities are early in the, in the process, um, I think that's really critical before you start. Um, you know, your script is a starting point. You really need a, a business plan uh, that, that's, that's, a, that's a business script coupled with it. So I encourage you to look at that, um, uh, at those options as early in the process as possible. And kind of combining that question with the previous topic, I mean, what are you seeing? Uh, in terms of uh, not only that question, how early in the process are these people getting involved in, in branding, and are they working on an extension of the movie? Are they are they working for to build a community outside of the film, of the film as a property itself, to sort of you know further their careers, or are they looking at are they looking at a, a, a property to property type right basis? I mean, uh, this conversation just it's making me think of workshops that uh, musicals and plays that are probably going to end up on Broadway go through for months and months and months and months and months before they're actually um, invested in or produced. And the reason why they do that is because they're creating some sort of network and some sort of story, some sort of database for people that are interested in the film and, excuse me, the play. And I think probably um, in terms of creating that sort of arena for a film and going back to what you were saying, um, broadening what the film represents in the culture that you're developing, that you're coming in on, is the most basic thing on earth, but a lot of people that are my age don't really realize uh, a website, I mean your own personal website, to really have your product there, at least part of it, and be able to kind of create a, at least a home for that, um, where you can expand it. I don't know, I see a lot of artists that are doing that, and the ones that are doing that are the ones that are really successful. They're the ones that we have in our shows that are shooting to cover the New York Times Magazine or shooting for Fader or have, have realized that, that that presence is extremely necessary. No one is going to go out to find that. They're only going to find other people. And if they present themselves professionally and they've done their research and they've done their workshops and they've done their, you know, their outside projects, then they'll probably get I think more and more filmmakers are yeah. savvy about that. Yeah. You know, I mean, a lot of the folks that I work with, a lot of the projects that I start working on in the phase, they've got a website set up, yeah. they've got a Facebook page up, they're out, <coughs> you know, sending occasional email blasts to whoever's on their existing list. Um, you know, I have a client right now who's, who's on Kickstarter uh, raising money for a film, and he shot. 
you just shot a couple test reels and like this is you know this is in the film but this is what it's going to look like right. this is some of the locations I'm going to shoot yeah. at you know uh, this is one of the actors I'm going to use right and, you not giving away the plot not giving away the right. plot but like this is sort of like the, the visual style of the film and and you know I think I, like I said I think more and more producers are becoming very savvy about that and uh, it's all for the benefit of the film because I mean, especially you know you, when you look at Kickstarter and projects raising money on Kickstarter that is Getting, right. I mean, lit, getting people literally invested in the film. You know, I mean, you know, just a, creating awareness, creating creating that um, sense of ownership on the scene. You know, among your audience. Um, I mean, so. any sort of presence, I think you'll if it's a professional one, will attract people that are interested in whether or not they're yeah. investors. I don't know, but um, at least your presence is out there for people to then find. Yeah. You know? I'm thinking back. I was. Uh, I did. I, I. I did a little bit of work on a film, and this is, I think, relevant because you mentioned one of the uh, benefits of going through someone like the producers' reps, and you can target the distributor that's right for you and work on that basis, work from that basis. This particular film was a documentary. It was a very cause-driven documentary, and it picked up and maintained a tremendous amount of momentum that then fueled the fundraising round for their next documentary that built on the first. Subsequent documentary screened in Berlin this year, and, and now you know they've they've taken that cause and they've uh, uh, the film and they've, they've they've built the hype not around the film as a property itself, but around the cause, mm -hmm. and that cause is going to maintain for I'm sure much you know for long in the future. But I'm wondering how much does the conversation shift when you uh, get away from a doc a cause of a documentary like that to a narrative project? And how do you maintain that enthusiasm? Whether you're talking about people financing you, Kickstarter or otherwise, or just people who look to ultimately watch it, and how do you maintain that over the course of the project development phase? I think, I mean, I, quickly, I just think it's really, again, presenting yourself professionally so that people aren't, well, on a documentary based level, it would be an interest in, uh, in the cause and in the vision. Um, investors and uh, people that are going to be interested in the project become interested. Um, as a professional, and, and I think that that's what people kind of miss out on again when they're focusing so uh, just far too finely on something that um, won't necessarily carry them 10 years into the future, but could if they used it um, as a backbone for their own personal career. Yeah, yeah. And just because if, you know, I mean, narrative films often, like not all of them, still have something to say. Yeah. They're, they're often still about an issue or about, you know, a, 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 a popular specific population or, or about, you know, the, they're about something. And so, you know, there can be a cause, there can be an issue involved in a narrative film that sustains that community. Um, or alternatively, it's just, you know, it's, it's you have a community of people who feel like they've discovered something and, and they, they, they want to continue to sustain, they want to tell their friends about this and, and they want to continue to sort of sustain the momentum of this this little gem that they've discovered. So. Sort of a microcosm of the larger issue for you know bigger films, how you know with Twitter and everything else, social media can kill an opening weekend, right? You know, screen word of mouth gets out so much quicker is sort of similar in that sense. Well, I mean a little bit of the opposite. I mean it can, it can build a film that might right. not have otherwise sort of reached the audience that it deserved or yeah. it need to reach. I'm sorry, I mean uh, I, you know, the answer is I think it, it works just as well for a narrative film because you've got all this opportunity to create and share culture, to put the viewer, um, in, inject the viewer into your environment, an environment that has, um, that has music, that has um, style, um, whether it's clothes or food, you know, and all these intriguing elements that bring an audience forward and just make them want to see that film and every element of that film all the more because it's cool, because it's authentic. Um, you know, that to me is the, the art of storytelling isn't just about the story. It's in setting the scene and that's it's the overture, not just the uh, not just the actual uh, play. And so I, I think again it's really we're just scratching the surface on how you can build a community. Um, for an hour of film, it's easy because it's well hanging fruit for most documentaries. But I think it's really fun, it's just as easy, um, and even more interesting for a narrative film. One way you do it is you, an example, well, you do a five minute prequel, and it sort of introduces 
um, something that, that is tangentially related to the film that you're about to make. It's not from the film, but it's inspired by, it may have some of the music, it may have just, you're, you're helping to develop an environment, a culture, and, uh, and, uh, and then you're, it's interesting if you're, because you're a good storyteller, so now you've got us already in the mood. Put me in the mood. That's what you got to do. I mean, most multi I mean, most artists nowadays that are really extremely successful are multi platform right? yeah. um, So I guess in some sense it's like doing that with a film, almost. Yeah. All different ways to tell a story. So in these uh, nowadays, what roles does the local, state, and national government uh, influence on the distribution creation of these films and how can we tax in the local resources they are available? Well, I mean, in terms of financially, you know, tax uh, credits and incentives, I guess, are sort of the most direct way that governments are involved. There's, you know, one in New York State, there's an additional one in New York City, we're actually filming the five boroughs, the national government, I don't I argue that Section 181 is a, is a federal government <coughs> incentive allowing um, uh, the, the application of, uh, of you know, deducting your, your production expenses in the, in, the, in the year which you make your, your film instead of through the accrual method. So that's, that's one way that the federal government's involved. But other countries have much more um, sophisticated commitments towards um, towards their film production. They, part of it is they want to encourage native, native culture, and many of those countries have treaties with other countries. We, we do not, um, but uh, you know, go outside the United States and you're in an elaborate uh, uh, array of, of, of countries, progressive countries that have these treaties and really encourage uh, international co-production. So. There's a lot more robust public money for film financing uh, outside the United States, like Stephen was saying. But you know, usually, you know, often you will have to have a certain number, be shooting a certain number of days in that country, or cast a certain number of actors who are, you know, nationals of that country. Or you, you have to find a way to qualify this as an Irish production or what have you, uh, a French production. But you find a way to do that, you know? And um, that's certainly a way to help close gaps in your financing. And if, if your movie is shot just as easily in Ireland as it is in upstate New York. Maybe another possibility, uh, this is way too much for discussion right now, it could be a whole panel, but keep, uh, getting into the federal government, you know, what sort of, uh, how do you think that the uh, Jobs Act is going to play out and the implications that has in the crowdfunding space? Is that maybe a possibility? Uh, moving, you know, toward an equity model for the crowd, crowdfunding space. I think that would make it a lot more unwieldy mm -hmm. in a way. I, I don't know. It, it's certainly a lot less attractive for the kinds of projects that are using Kickstarter or other crowdfunding, you know, mechanisms right now. You know, I don't have a crystal ball, but um, I, I think that where the Jobs Act can play a role once the regulations are distributed is, is the ability to advertise these projects to accredited investors. Right now, you're not allowed to go out there and, and advertise and solicit. But uh, uh, the, uh, the possibility exists, and I think maybe the probability is that the the SEC is going to open up the ability for uh, for entrepreneurs to advertise their projects again, only to uh, to the general public, but only allowing accredited investors who have qualified and have uh, income thresholds that are that can sustain the risk of working in these projects. I see that as a change, and I think that's a positive. If that happens, I think it'll contribute to. Um, to uh, financing the benefits. I guess uh, any more questions, throw them out there. Um, but sort of to start to wrap up, uh, do you think that a, a dominant digital platform will emerge 
mean, there, there are more and more, we talked about a little bit more and more films that have been successful, uh, you know, with the VOD releases, day and day releases. Do you think that, you know, the success of those films and the track that they take is going to influence the emergence of the dominant platform, or is it going to be a custom tailored, play it by ear, each project type of thing moving forward, and we'll see the same issues arise each year? I don't know about a dominant. I mean, by platform, do you mean like an actual portal or are you yeah. talking about a model? Yeah. No, I mean, you know, iTunes and Netflix and Amazon are big right now. There may be another one in two years that comes along and has some sort of innovation in their uh, user interface that makes them more attractive to Netflix or they undercut their subscription price. I mean, I think where it, where it is it is going and it will continue to go is that there's not going to be a functional distinction television and internet, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's you know, Netflix is already uh, doing deals where they are purchasing the first pay TV, you know, your initial pay TV window, like they're outbidding HBO, yeah. that kind of thing. And Amazon sort of kind of just thing. did the same thing with, yeah. uh, with Mount Cavity. Right. Um, so I, I agree with that. I think um, around, the, around the corner, you should expect to see Google play a very, very significant role in, um, in how audiences access content. Uh, they have that the YouTube platform is, is, is being redesigned as we speak. It is <coughs> become the jukebox of the uh, new generation looking for music, and I think it certainly has that ability to be a gangbuster platform, digital platform for film. I mean, and there's no, I mean, you know, it's all coming into your house in the same thing. You yeah. know, and the fact that you watch it on a, on a traditional television screen or on your laptop sort of shouldn't make a difference. It is increasingly not making a difference in terms yeah. of how it is. Changing habits too, I mean, all the different screens, smaller screens now, and all that influences the success of different models to an extent as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, and it's also, you know, frankly, you know, a lower budget film, like the, the, the quality of the film is not necessarily impacted quite as much by watching it on the smaller screen. You know, you're not, it's not a film where you're going out and you're spending $50 million on, you know, huge CGI effects that you really want to watch in a theater necessarily. So. I saw a, a video of a panel that was at Sundance this year done by The Wrap, and they had, they were talking about sort of this the same some of the same issues that we've been addressing um, and talking about the vanity aspect of wanting a theatrical release for every project um, and how you know the perception might be that you know that's that's the ultimate but then you know you have this you have this theatrical experience that's a traditional thing it's so great but on the flip side you can have a very you can have a very different but no less intimate or meaningful relationship uh, experience, etc., viewing a film on a much smaller screen, and so you know that might influence the success of the VOD generally, not a specific platform, but VOD generally moving forward. Potentially, but you, you certainly have a generation that's very comfortable with watching films on um, on iPads, on uh, on, on uh, their mobile devices, and, um, and I, I really feel that that's. Uh, that's where the audience is, um, is coming, and certainly the, the way you make films you know, the, the will, will cater to that. You will see a lot more in, in low budget uh, filmmaking, digital filmmaking, because that's really where where the audience is. You don't need that kind of a lot of money to tell, to tell a good story that's interesting to them. They're already eating up every, all the good comedy. That's, so much of that is, is low to low budget work. So, you know, I think it will influence, uh, I think the good news is that you'll have original storytelling. The good news is that if you, if you like effects, and you like you know, rich score, and you know, traditional, traditional cinema, and stars, you know, it's, that's a, it's just a different market. But right? that's what, uh, it's certainly becoming more, uh, the generation uh, is accepting these, these low budget raw um, uh, production uh, production values. So I think that I think it's a good thing in terms of distinct uh, new voices that we're going to be we're going to be um, seeing and, and hearing from. On, on that note, you have to pay attention to 
to this tidal wave of, of, um, of filmmaking coming from that generation. I'm watching my own home and community, um, teenagers making their movies. Uh, you look at the tidal wave of, of, uh, of what's going on with the, the Harlem Shake phenomenon. And these kids have trouble writing a, writing a, a two-page essay about the, about the Odyssey or, or some other, or, or Shakespeare. They have no problem in, 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 in shooting and editing and uploading a, um, you know, a fun video with a Harlem Shake in 30 minutes. I mean, that, that's just, you know, think about this, the, you know, the, the new voices that are seamlessly um, telling their stories and being able to you know, shoot, edit, and upload you know, you know, from, from, their, from their desktop bedrooms. You know. Know, at school, it's, uh, this is, you know, everyone, remember, you know, they used to say everyone is a, uh, you know, is a, is a novelist, they have a, or a screenplay and a draw, well now everyone is a filming. And, you know, so be prepared for that, everyone is, uh, you know, it's a tidal wave of content out there. And, and most of these folks, they don't, they don't care about traditional distribution. They're absolutely content to just put it up there. And, uh, and if it's good, it goes viral, it's great. And, you know, Another one, another one, and look more and more for short, short form content because they don't have the patience to watch, uh, to watch narr uh, feature length narratives, or or to, or, or to write a screenplay for feature length, a feature length uh, project. So that's that's where I see the trend. Going. Is that is that tidal wave sort of the driving force behind uh, the distributors, new distributors coming into the market? To, established distributors trying to position themselves to capitalize on that, you know, uh, as of yet untapped scale, that momentum, is that, you see that happening? Well, I think, I mean, I think we do sort of need to make it, I mean, I think there is a distinction between people who are out there making sort of feature-length films and people who are uploading videos <laughs> to, to YouTube, but, you know, that said, certainly, you know, it's, the, 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 the sort of ascendant of digital filmmaking technology has made it even easier for people to get feature-length films made, and like serious feature-length films made, and certainly there are more of them. I don't know if that is the reason why there's more distributors now, um, but you know, it, it's it's there's certainly. I mean, there's there is more content out there, and that's why these digital platforms, like I've been saying all night, are so important because. There's lots of quality films that are never going to get a traditional distribution deal, yeah. but but have an audience out there waiting, you know, for them to connect. Yeah. So, talk about audience. You were saying earlier how large the audience was for your for your launch. Well, I was actually just thinking about that because Ryan is showcasing one of his films in April, and it's interesting because all night you've been saying rather than doing a traditional screening, find you know a venue to hold an event in or find a venue to um, a smaller menu to invite friends and family and um, people you've made personal relationships and that may possibly invest in something in your future. And um, I mean, that's pretty much what, what we do. And we end up reaching, uh, in one of the evenings, about 500 people through a very non traditional route. Yeah. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's finding those little, those little holes that you can But it's not just non traditional, I think it's more intimate. Right. Uh, compare your venue with the traditional go to the movie theater, you get your popcorn, and uh, you know there, there's commercials first, and then these very loud trailers, and then you know a half hour later you, you get to see your film, and there's no ability to really talk about right. the film or meet the filmmaker you know, at the at the uh, multiplex. Well, I think uh, it's a much more meaningful cinematic experience where you get to speak to the artist and you get to have a community and and, um, and discuss the project and maybe become a fan and establish a relationship with the with the, with the filmmaker with the material I mean, I'm, I'm excited about the, you know, the sort of new new trends and I think what you're what you're doing really contributes to uh, you know to this uh, more uh, intimate uh, reaction or, or interplay with, uh, between the, um, the filmmaker and, and the community, the audience. There, anybody got any more questions? 
we'll probably wrap it up. No? Well, thank you again for coming out. Really appreciate it. Um, thank you again to the speakers. Hope you guys got some useful tips out of this. I guess that's it.